yeah, follow that. <laughs> As we were saying, anyway. Anyway, all of us in the room know that we can help the Prime Minister and the Mayor of London to improve on that architectural vision. I think that's, uh, <laughs> right? We, 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 we. Let's go back to the world and not just the center of the world, which we clearly know is Romford. Um, very important to frame these discussions in a global context because even though we are discussing these issues in very much a sort of a global north, western-centric um, condition, we need to understand that the growth areas are where we pointed out uh, in the maps before. But it's just interesting to think about this not just in terms of um, scale and uh, numbers of uh, population, but purely in terms of time. Um, if you look at these numbers here, it's the number of people moving into New Delhi, into Lagos, into Mumbai, for every hour. That is, for every minute and a half that I'm speaking, someone new has moved into these particular cities. It's the other side of what Anshu was saying at the beginning. But think of the impact then on the need for the infrastructures that we've been talking about, schools, hospitals, housing, water, and everything else, let alone electricity provision. I want to just now focus on two very short things before we, I wind up. One is the form of the city and how it relates to this, and uh, some of the technologies that we've been looking at. It is clear that if cities continue to grow in the way that they have been growing for the last years or so, we're going to have a problem. This is Mexico City. There's no limit to where it grows. The negative impact on the environments are clear. This is Hong Kong, another way to do it. I'm not saying this is the best way to do it, but we have choices. Let's just look at two examples, what can actually happen, which is both negative and positive. Sao Paulo, a city of something like 14 million people, commuting hours every day or something like four hours a day. So those who can afford to uh, don't do this because they can't waste the time, they take a helicopter. Is that a way forward? Now, the mayor of Bogota actually is here, Enrique Piñalosa. He had the same problem. Here was a city growing at the same speed. And instead of actually going the Sao Paulo route, shall I call it, invested in very simple mechanisms such as a bus uh, like this or even more importantly a cycleway. Think of the social and psychological connection between these three people with the father taking the cycle to go to work um, and taking the kids to school. Think of that relationship and how better that is as a result of what we call at the Electric City a new form of technology. So it's connecting the physical, the virtual and the social is at the heart of the work we do. We've studied a number of cities that we call pioneer cities, these are some of them, only to do one thing, to understand, and I'm not gonna go through these graphs, to understand the fact that even though all these cities and all these economies more or less have grown despite the recession in the last years, those are the gray um, lines on the map, they've gone slightly up. The yellow lines on the whole, which is CO2 emissions, carbon emissions, have actually gone down. We don't have to consume more and pollute more is the simple issue, and we'll hear a lot about that. At the heart of this is this issue of density. We've heard about it uh, before, and we'll hear about it in the next session. Let's take three cities, London, New York, and Hong Kong. Well, what we've done at the LSE is actually measured their density. London sounds, feels dense at times, but compared to New York, it's only half the density. This is where people live. And look how dense Hong Kong is in terms of people literally living together. This is new work we've just done. It's in the newspaper, and it shows you where people work. And it's interesting. So I'm going to flick back. That's where people live. This is where people work. And here is why these three cities are global centers. There's great concentration of people, nearly the same, London, New York, and Hong Kong. The difference is that in Hong Kong, people live close and work close. And in a way, that's one of the most efficient systems in the world. On London, we've done a lot of work. We've just heard from the Prime Minister and the Mayor that this part of London, Silicon Roundabout, is the heart of a sort of new thinking of the city. London's not doing badly, if you look at this, in terms of CO2 emissions over the last years. It's beginning to go down even though the economy is growing. There's a lot more to do. Interestingly, that, uh, that Boris mentioned the fact that East London is where investment is going, and you can see this in some of the work that we've presented. 
probably more positive than anything else, and again, it's the statistic uh, that was referred to before, there are clusters of London where there are new forms of economy creating new jobs and new opportunities and attracting people from around the world. So something like 50,000 people are working in technologies in this area. I think I want to end by saying one thing. What we studied at the Urban Age over the years is cities from around the world. The one thing that matters most is resilience. To design a city so that it only can do one thing never works. London was never designed to be a virtual capital. Uh, it is becoming so. London was never designed uh, to be a city which had one of the most sophisticated systems of uh, underground and other sort of service. But it is exactly the resilience of the built form and the infrastructure which informed the debate, which brings the social, the physical, and the virtual together. Thank you very much, and thank you for your patience in the uh, extended program this morning. Thank you.